The concept of adolescence has gone through many changes in cinema over the decades. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we'll be exploring the evolution of coming-of-age movies. For this video, we're taking a deep dive into teen representation in film and looking at individual properties that exemplify the changes in the genre. If you consider the genre of coming-of-age movies, almost every example released this year or decades ago boils down to a plot where the characters confront a period of questioning their place in the world. Typically, our protagonist is a character from between the ages of 12 and 18 who experiences a conflict that forces them to look inward to try and figure out who they really are and who they want to be. Another common theme that nearly everyone can relate to is the idea of being misunderstood by the people around you, in particular, the grown-ups in your life. But we think you're crazy to make us write an essay telling you who we think we are. And you see us as you want to see us. In the simplest terms, with the most convenient definitions. With that overview done, let's look at some of the earliest examples of this genre on film. Rebel Without a Cause, released in 1955, is often pointed to as the first major example of teen alienation in the movies. And it's become iconic since its release. When I didn't have to be all confused, and I didn't have to feel that I was ashamed of everything, if I felt that I belonged someplace, you know? In fact, some say that the concept of a teenager as we know it was only really introduced between the 1940s and 1950s in works such as the French film The 400 Blows, which also looks at teenage rebellion. In the decades that followed, the 1960s and 70s, more and more films opted to focus on the issue of growing up. The Graduate, which hit theaters in 1967, looked at a slightly older demographic, focusing on a young man wrapping up his college degree while still following someone trying to figure out what his life looks like next. Well, it's very comfortable just to drift here. Have you thought about graduate school? No. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. It's a somewhat satirical take on issues facing the youth at the time, but still packed a major punch and quickly became a cinema classic. George Lucas's American Graffiti was released in 1973, but was set a decade earlier as a nostalgic look to a simpler time in Lucas's own youth. Well, I was thinking I could wait a year, you know, go to city for a while. You chicken thing. Oh, wait a minute. After all we went through to get accepted, we're finally getting out of this turkey town and now you want to crawl back into your cell, right? Then, although they didn't look like teens, Greece was the word for the students at Rydell High, putting the teen experience to song. I met a girl crazy for me. When you think of coming-of-age movies, however, some of the most prominent examples that come to mind are likely from the 80s and probably involved John Hughes. I know, it just hurts. That's why they call them crushes. If they were easy, they call them something else. With the creation of films like Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Pretty in Pink, all released in the mid-1980s, Hughes wrote and or directed some of cinema's most beloved films. His most popular works largely look at the issues facing suburban teens and straddle the line between comedy and drama, bringing a levity to the genre that has caused them to become so beloved. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Despite the decades between the 80s and today, these movies are still largely relatable because of the common threads that tie young people together no matter when they were born. Several of his films have female protagonists, bringing some gender diversity to the genre that for a long time focused on the stories of young men rather than women. So I'll let them know that they didn't break me. Even films like Back to the Future, despite dealing primarily with time travel, showcase that even if it's at a soda shop in the 1950s, teens are teens just the same. I'm George, George McFly. I'm your density. I mean, your destiny. The 80s were essentially the heyday of the teen movie, with many other classics also being released during the decade. Francis Ford Coppola directed multiple films focusing on teenage gangs. The Outsiders and Rumblefish. Heathers was a black comedy personified, giving us a cautionary tale of what it takes to fit in. I just killed my best friend. And your worst enemy. Same difference. 
We also cannot forget the coming-of-age journeys of Baby in Dirty Dancing or Lloyd and Diane in Say Anything, boomboxes and all. Nobody really thinks it will work, do they? No. We just described every great success story. Since the John Hughes era, the coming-of-age story has become a mainstay in film, and writers and directors have branched out to cover stories that represent a wider demographic of the population. One of the landmark films in the genre is Boys in the Hood, which was written and directed by John Singleton and released in 1991, and looks at issues faced by black youth that are unique to their circumstances. Either they don't know, don't show, I don't care about what's going on in the hood. The 90s also saw the horror and gross-out comedy genres become ones that teens could see and see themselves in. 1996's Scream was a landmark and inspired many a Halloween costume after. Films like American Pie made you realize that maybe you shouldn't underestimate Bandcamp and that you were so glad your parents weren't as embarrassing. Well, this is the, this is the uh, female form, and uh, they have uh, focused on the breasts. And though you may not immediately recognize them, some of the defining films of the mid to late 1990s were adaptations of old works. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. Bat, did you write that? That's like a famous quote. From where? Cliff's Notes. Oh. Clueless was a Beverly Hills makeover of Jane Austen's Emma, and Ten Things I Hate About You closed out the millennium with a reimagining of Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew. Yep, that's right. Billy Shakes can write a really good high school rom-com. No offense or anything. I mean, I know everyone digs your sister, but, um, she's without. Though it's hard to deny that the 80s were the golden age of the teen films, the 2000s are hard to beat. Female leads were interesting and perfectly imperfect, carrying on the tradition of the makeover scene that we'd seen at the end of the century. Because Majesty, only Paolo gonna take this and this and give you a princess. Film franchises like High School Musical and Twilight were born, making teens and some of their mothers get their heads in the game and develop complicated feelings for a sparkly vampire. The coming of age genre wasn't just for girls either. Films like Superbad were quoted at lockers left and right by everyone and their friend McLovin. Number two, it doesn't even have a first name, it just says McLovin. What? One name? One name? Who are you, Seal? Fogel? This ID says you're 25 years old. Why wouldn't you just put 21, man? We got to see female friendship come to the fore with the sisterhood of the traveling pants. But it was in 2004 when a very fetch movie came into the cultural consciousness. Mean Girls. What is fetch? Oh, it's like slang from England. Even over a decade later, this film has shaped how we speak, how we enjoy Jingle Bell Rock, and especially how we look at high school. Being with the plastics was like being famous. People looked at you all the time, and everybody just knew stuff about you. While it was all well and good to reshape our lives to look more like the ones on screen, the 2010s were a time of bringing hard and real conversations into teen movies. Alcoholism was explored in The Spectacular Now, while cancer and illness left us in puddles in movie theaters going to see The Fault in Our Stars and Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. But those films also impressed the hope to be found in hard times. The drop in his academic performance this year is a consequence of all the time he spent with me and the time he spent making things for me, and how hard that was for him. As time has gone on, filmmakers have felt more licensed to diversify the stories told about teenagers, moving away from the textbook suburban dramedy to cover a more broad spectrum of the experiences that adolescents face. For instance, we've seen mental illness addressed in movies like The Edge of Seventeen and The Perks of Being a Wallflower. <laughs> all loved the teen movies of the 20th century and the turn of the 21st, the 2010s showed everyone just how far the genre, and film in general, had to go in terms of representation. A more current coming-of-age story focusing on a young black character is 2016's Moonlight created by Barry Jenkins, which took home the Academy Award for Best Picture. I want to do a lot of things that don't make sense. I didn't say it don't make sense. But tell me, like, like what? <laughs> like what lot of things? The film shows us our main character going through three significant periods in his life. 
finding more of his identity every step of the way. Moonlight also addresses the struggles faced by queer youth, which is another issue that's been addressed in more recent iterations of films from the genre. The following year, we saw the release of Call Me By Your Name, which told the story of a young Jewish boy discovering his sexuality while living in Italy in the early 80s and developing feelings for an older scholar staying with his family. Though it was a critical hit and made waves during award season, it was a film released in 2018 that became the first movie released by a major Hollywood studio to feature a gay teen love story at its center. I don't care if you didn't think that my coming out was going to be a big thing, Martin. Look, you don't get to decide that. I'm supposed to be the one that decides when and where and how and who knows and how I get to say it that's supposed to be my thing. And you took that away from me. Love, Simon brought stories of queer adolescents one step further into the mainstream. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. In some recent films, we've also seen how technology and social media have affected how we grow up. Bo Burnham's film Eighth Grade, which follows middle schooler Kayla as she navigates the social landscape, is a great example. As our lives increasingly exist online, we can only imagine this trend will continue. As always, uh, please uh, share and subscribe to my channel if you guys like the video. And thanks for watching. Gucci! Considering how much coming-of-age films have progressed in the last several decades, we can't wait to see where the genre will go next. We couldn't possibly cover all the incredible films in this category in one video, so share your favorites in the comments. I want you to be the very best version of yourself that you can be. What if this is the best version? Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.